you will stand with me while we um, begin to pray. The Bible says, By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that in the fruit of our lips, the living, sorry, <laughs> that of the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name continually. Jesus, God, we come to give you praise and thanks in this place tonight, Jesus. Have your way in this place tonight, Jesus. Lord, move through each and every one of us tonight. Have your way, Jesus. We worship you, God. We praise you, Lord. We love you, God. We ask that you would have your way in this place, that your will be done tonight. Have your way, Jesus, upon each and every one of us. Have your way. Have your way tonight, Jesus. Move in a mighty way tonight. Let your fire come down and move through each and every one of us. God, we give you the praise. We give you the glory. We give you the worship tonight. We come to give you praise and honor and worship. Hallelujah. We love you, Jesus. We praise you, Jesus. Have your way tonight, God. Have your Church no longer want to stay the same. We know what less we build this it's
Come on, somebody thank the Lord that he's building his church and that I get to be a part of it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We are so glad to be in the house of the Lord tonight. We're so grateful for what we feel. If this is your first time at CLC, we want to officially say welcome. Welcome. We are so glad that you decided to join in worship with us tonight. Um, if, you, if you had received a welcome card, you can fill out that welcome card. You can place it in the offering here in just a moment. Um, all that is is just so that we can connect and uh, send you a little gift, a little token of appreciation, and then also so you can be plugged into what's happening here at CLC. Um, why don't we take a couple minutes, greet your neighbor, greet the person next to you, walk across the aisle, let them know you're glad to be in the house of the Lord. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. We are, again, we are so glad that everybody's here. As you find your way back to your seat, we are about to worship God through giving. And, and give each and every one of us an opportunity to be blessed as the ushers come. We are a church who puts faith in action amen so please stand as the ushers come there are four ways to give through the tithely app online the text to give um, option the offering plate and then the kiosk out front let's read our offering decree together thou shalt also decree a thing and it shall be established unto thee and the light shall shine upon thy ways i am a cheerful giver Today I bring your tithe and my offering to put into your storehouse. I also give my faith in action offering according to the pledge I made to you. Therefore the enemy is rebuked and every curse is broken. Upon the authority of your word I have given and it shall be given unto me. Press down, 
shaken together and running over. You will pour upon me such blessings that there is not room enough to receive. I receive your blessings in my family, finances, body, and spirit. All that I do will prosper according to your word. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. If you believe that, shout amen. amen. Praise the Lord. You can be seated. We've got just a couple quick announcements to, to go through. Uh, firstly, we have Christian Life University, which is every Sunday at 9 a.m. If you were able to be a part of 301 this past Tuesday, would you raise your hand? There's a bunch of people in here. There was such a, an awesome class, a big class. Um, and, and that Tuesday, uh, pastor was, was teaching that class, and it was just, it was awesome. Um, if you want to be a part of that, please do what you can. You can just go through the 101 class if you haven't done that, and then go through the 201 class with Brother Joe Salamita. And, um, and then you can, you can, once you're done with those, you can jump right into that 301 class when, the next time it comes around. Um, and that 301, CLU, or CLU 301 is every Tuesday at 7 p.m. So it'll be uh, every Tuesday, 7 p.m., uh, for those of you that already started making it, we've already discussed. We're going to try to make it to every single one um, while this class is available. And then, and that's in the fellowship hall as well. And then Elevate Youth has Focus this Friday. They're excited about that. That's April 12th at 7 p.m. There'll be snacks, games, and Bible study. Uh, there's a new series of Apostolic Identity. And um, if you want to be a part of that, or if you're a young person, or if you have young children, you can contact the Osbournes and, uh, and get involved there. And then we've got a lunch fundraiser. Somebody say lunch fundraiser. This Sunday, uh, this Sunday, April 14th, after the morning service, uh, be sure to make, make plans to support our Bible quizzers and elevate youth and have a time of fellowship with CLC family. There is going to be jerk pork smoked chicken, rice with mac and cheese. I feel my help coming from the Lord. Green beans and dessert. Um, and so there'll be, it's $12 for ages 12 and up, and then $7 for, um, for children. You can't even get McDonald's for that price anymore. I mean, it is what it is. So come and get some real food, some real fellowship, and we'll have a great time. Uh, if it's your first time, if you've never been to one of our lunch fundraisers, it's on us. So please come invite somebody so that they can get a free meal as well. All forms of payment um, are accepted and to-go boxes are available for purchase. All of these events and more can be found on our website at clcflagler.com. Worship with us.
Hallelujah. Let's clap our hands unto the Lord and give God a great big shout of praise. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Great is our God. You're mighty. You're powerful. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Woo. Hallelujah. Praise God. Come on, youth choir. My Lord. Be thankful for this youth choir up here. They sound so good. I'm thankful for the anointing that I feel. You can return to your seats, remain standing. We're going to dive into the Word of God together. Uh, thank you for coming on a Wednesday night. You could have done so many things, but you obeyed God and you came to church. And uh, the Bible says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, as the manner of some is, but so much the more as you see the day approaching. We're not supposed to have less church, we're supposed to have more church. And uh, I'm just thankful for the faithful saints of God that come. We're going to grow together tonight. I want to talk tonight. Um, about some stuff I've been feeling for a few weeks and I'll probably do a part one tonight and a part two Sunday night but we'll get into it and see how far we get I don't I don't think I'll uh, be more than three hours tonight max so we should be good on time I do want to say before I get going we just had a very young lady celebrate a birthday in our church Nina Benuke celebrated 73 years young We are so thankful for her, and, sh and the kids are especially thankful for her. You may or may not have noticed, uh, Sister Nina is an unending supply of chocolate, candy, toys, just all kinds of brainwashing goodness for every child that's in the church, and she is, uh, she is so loved. We love her so much. Praise God. Acts chapter 8 and verse 14. While you're turning there, I want to say thank you to the CLU crew, the 301 class that was here last night. We had a good time in the Holy Ghost, excited for the journey. If you have not signed up for Christian Life University, that is the next step for you. If you've never done it, that is the next step in ministry and in discipleship in this church. And you just, you'll just have a blast and grow with Jesus in the Word. Praise God. Acts chapter 8, verse 14. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. Everybody say they put their hands on them. That's kind of weird, isn't it? They put their hands on them and they got the Holy Ghost. First Timothy 4, chapter 14, the Apostle Paul says to his son in the Gospel, Timothy, neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery with the laying on of the hands everybody say they put their hands on them tonight I'm gonna to talk about how you put your hands on people in church I'm gonna talk about altar working altar working why don't we put our Bibles down let's lift our hands and our voices to the Lord and let's ask God to have his way father we love you in the name of Jesus I pray Lord tonight that you would give us understanding I pray, God, that you would give us wisdom. We want to be effective altar workers. We want to be focused on the field properly. God, give us your spirit guidance to make us highly effective in your purpose in building the kingdom. And everybody say, in Jesus' name. Turn to three people, tell them how nice they look tonight, and you may be seated. We are, 
what I would affectionately call a spirit-filled church. Um, I don't know that we have, I don't know that we ever have boring church at Christian Life Center. I think in every single service there is dancing. I think some people were dancing tonight. You might have seen people bunny hopping in place. Uh, if you look in one part of the sanctuary, somebody's going to be saying, I love you, Jesus. If you look in another part of the sanctuary, somebody may be saying something in a language you do not understand. Somebody over here may be crying. Somebody over there may be laughing. We are a spirit-led church, spirit-filled church. I, I don't want religious church. I want Holy Ghost Church. I want the power of God church. I want the kind of church that they had in the book of Acts where the Bible says that the place where when they had come together, they prayed, the place was shaken. It's like the whole world shaken when a bunch of spirit-filled people make up their minds, we're going to get together and worship God in one accord and in one place boy it's a powerful exciting thing and with that it may seem chaotic it may seem spontaneous and there is a there is a chaotic nature to the wind jesus said to nicodemus he said the wind bloweth this is john chapter 3 verses 1 through 5 when he talked about being born again, he said, the wind bloweth where it listeth or where it wants to. You can't tell where it's coming from. You can't tell where it's going. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. There is a spontaneous nature to Spirit-led. There is a combustible nature to spirit-led there is a wind nature all of a sudden a breeze just kind of goes through and if the breeze is strong enough it might knock over a tree here and there that's that is part of the nature to it but paul gave instruction when he was talking to i would say the most gifted 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 church in scripture the church at Corinth he said every one of you hath a psalm hath a doctrine hath the tongue hath a prophecy hath a revelation uh, every time they would come to church they would have some kind of new idea new philosophy new interpretation new tongue he said you guys are carnal is that weird you would think the people that are doing all that stuff are extremely spiritual he said I can't feed you with meat I have to feed you with milk and he said you're out of order well what are you saying Paul aren't we a spirit-filled church aren't we a spirit-led church yeah but let all things be done decently and in order there is a spirit order to the chaos there is, there is a method, if you will, to the madness. There is a design to what is going on. And it's in Scripture. As a matter of fact, in the book of Hebrews, the writer said, we're leaving the foundation of the doctrine of the principles of Christ. Moving on from the foundation like tongues and repentance and laying on of hands these things are entry level let's move on into deeper things like the blood of jesus christ the cross of jesus christ the covenant the mediator of the covenant and so there is there is an explicit teaching in scripture about how to have church why we speak in tongues the method of speaking in tongues the reason why one type of speaking in tongues is different from another type of speaking in tongues 
Paul gave us the distinction. He said, not every tongue is the same. There's, there's speaking in tongues when you first receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. It's evidenced by speaking in tongues. This happened in the book of Acts chapter 2. It happened in the book of Acts chapter 8, chapter 10, chapter 19. And there is the law of first mention when the Holy Ghost fell for the first time, when people were baptized in the Spirit for the first time, they spoke with tongues. That was the evidence that God used to show them you have now crossed over to a new dimension. And I, I have discussed this many times because that's kind of a controversial statement to say when you first receive the Holy Ghost, you will speak with tongues. And I, I've talked to people and I have heard some very valid points and good points about this. And in John chapter 20, uh, Jesus looked at his disciples and he breathed on them. Receive ye the Holy Ghost. And yet, those same disciples were gathered in Acts chapter 1 at the foot of the mountain when Jesus was leaving. And he said, Go, tarry in Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, Ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but you, all the guys that I breathed on and prophesied on, you guys are going to be baptized with the Holy Ghost in just a few days on the day of Pentecost. And when you look at when the day of Pentecost was fully come, Acts chapter 2, verse 1, they were all with one accord in one place. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. There appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, Peter, James, John, Bartholomew, Nathaniel, Everybody, all the disciples were filled with the Holy Ghost. And the Bible says they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. And that moment is the birth of the church. That was the moment that the church was born. That was the new birth personified. This was the fulfillment of what Jesus talked about in John chapter 3 to Nicodemus. The Bible says there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus who came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. And Jesus said unto Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus had a very valid point. He said, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus said unto him, verily, verily, I say unto thee, truly. Let me tell you the truth, buddy. Except a man be born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. And so... Being born of the water in spirit is what Peter taught in Acts chapter 2 at the birth of the church. In Acts 2.38, he talked about water in spirit. When the people realized they had rejected their Messiah, Peter looks at all the people. And after, this is after everybody got the Holy Ghost talking in tongues and, and that sort of chaos entered the church. And they were having a good business meeting up until that point. They were having some good prayer until that point and then all of a sudden the fire fell and they started they did something outrageous they got outside of those walls and there was probably people dancing in the streets bunny hopping in the streets they were doing something in the streets because the people looked read acts chapter 2 it says that that when they saw them they they looked at these people that came out of the upper room and they said these people are drunk with new wine they are inebriated with alcohol. The only way you act like that, you, you can't be that happy unless you're intoxicated. And Peter recognized the order that needed to be established on this spirit flow. And the Bible says, Peter standing up with the eleven lifted up his voice and said, you men of Judea. Hey, everybody, listen, let me tell you, these people are not drunk like you think they're drunk. They are drunk, but not like you think they're drunk. 
He said, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. On my servants and upon my handmaidens, in those days will I pour out of my spirit. He began to explain to them what you are seeing, what you are feeling is something that was prophesied a thousand years ago. What we are experiencing experiencing right now in this room is the same thing Peter talked about 2,000 years ago. This is not something new. This is something very, very old. This is not a new doctrine. It's a very, very old doctrine. It's not a new denomination. It's the only denomination found in the Bible. And of course, Peter told those Jews from every nation under heaven, the Bible says, he told them, you crucified your Messiah. And when they heard that, the Bible says, this is Acts 2 and 37, when they heard that, they were pricked in their heart. And they said unto the preacher, the Peter, and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? What, what do we do? We killed our Savior. What do we do? Then Peter said unto them, repent. Repent and be baptized everybody say born of the water and be baptized every one of you in the name of the lord jesus christ for the remission of your sins and ye shall receive the gift of the holy ghost everybody say spirit baptism peter was rehearsing reciting explaining the conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus in John chapter 3. You must be born of the water and the Spirit. So Peter said, get baptized in Jesus' name. And when you get baptized in Jesus' name, you're going to get the Holy Ghost. You're going to get the Holy Ghost. And, and so the revival moved forward. It began to spread. And after that, that preaching at the end of the chapter, in, in chapter 2, the Bible says about 3,000 people were born again. It went from 12 to 120 to 3,000. And when you move a few chapters down, one of the deacons that they prayed for, there were two deacons that, that stand out among the rest. There were Stephen and there was Philip. Um, there was so much work to be done in the church and um, things were being neglected and people started griping because they weren't being uh, appreciated enough and, and, and Peter said, look, it's not meat, that, it's not fitting that we should leave the word of God and prayer and, and fasting and, 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 and scrub tables. We got to do what God's called us to do and so they sought out men of wisdom and two of those men was Stephen. Stephen would end up being the first martyr. The Bible says that Stephen was full of faith and power. They could not resist the wisdom by which he spake. He did great wonders and signs among the people. And, and then there was another guy named Philip. He's just a deacon. He's just a servant. The Bible says in Acts chapter 8 that Philip went down to Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Preached Christ unto them. Philip was not an apostle. Philip did not preach on the day of Pentecost, but Philip was focused on the field. And I, I, I got to tell you, I, the Lord, uh, he always does this, or not always, maybe 95% of the time. I, I've been listening, seeking, studying, praying, and, um, and all of a sudden, an hour and 30 minutes before church, I get three messages. And now I'm struggling because I want to tell you everything, all three. I'm sticking with the first one. Y'all keep looking at me like that. I'm going to do all three of them tonight. We're doing all three services. But I want to tell you something. It doesn't matter if you're an apostle, a deacon. What Deacon means servant. My God have mercy. It doesn't matter if you are whatever level you think you are in the kingdom of God. When you turn your attention to the field, when you put your focus on the field, 
God will begin to use you in ways that will blow your mind. If we can, as a church, get field focused. The most miserable people on the planet are self focused. Miserable, man. Miserable people come to church and it's all about them. What's God going to do for me tonight? And they sit there and they just wait grumpily for it to happen. But when you're focused on the field, it's fulfillment. It's power. It's purpose. And Philip, Philip could have said, no, I can't go teach Bible studies in Samaria. I'm just a servant in the church. But thank God Philip went. And it wasn't even something the apostles were a part of. And the Bible says the entire city with one accord, this is Acts chapter 8, gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Demons were cast out of people. There were miracle signs and wonders. And the Bible says Philip baptized the entire city in water in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He wanted to rehearse and recite and obey the command of Jesus uh, that you must be born of the water and the spirit but Acts chapter 8 verse 16 says the Holy Ghost had fallen upon none of them only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus now this is important because it explains to us something you can believe on Jesus and not have the Holy Ghost. I, I want to just tell you right now, I want to teach you in the Word of God, this scripture and others like it, put it back up there for me, proves to us that you can believe on Jesus and yet not have the Holy Ghost. If you look in previous scriptures, it says the entire city with one accord gave heed to those things which Philip spake. The Bible says he preached Christ unto them. They believed in Jesus because of Philip's preaching. But at that moment, he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Go back one verse. Who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. I just wanted you to know what the he was. Now, Acts 8, 16. For as yet he, the Holy Ghost, was fallen upon none of them. Nobody had the Holy Ghost. So what did they do? Next scripture. Then laid they their hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost they put their hands on them now I know this is not a COVID friendly message this is not a pandemic friendly message this is not a hygienically friendly message germ friendly message you know Jesus tells us to do something that absolutely defies medical science with regard to germs he said believers shall lay hands upon the sick he did not say believers shall social distance themselves from the sick so that you don't catch it you know what was different? I'm so out of my notes. I feel such an unction from the Lord right now. You, you know what was different about Jesus and everybody else? When the lepers came to town, everybody else was running away. Jesus was walking towards them. God help us to be spiritual enough not to fear diseases. Hey, I, and I'm not talking about, you know, going and, and, and kissing somebody with tuberculosis. And you should wash your hands after you pray for them. But folks, I'm going to believe the Bible over everything. 
I'm going to believe the Bible over. I'm going to do what the Bible says over everything. God is bigger than germs. God is bigger than sickness. God is bigger than leprosy. Because when Jesus touched the lepers, he didn't become leprous. They became healed. When Jesus touched the diseased, he didn't get the disease. They became well. They became whole. God helped the people of God to be full enough of the Holy Ghost that we lay hands on the sick and they recover. Believers shall lay hands upon the sick and they shall recover. Amen. That's Mark chapter 16. And so, so Philip, who was a servant, called for Peter and John. Peter and John came to Samaria. And this is something that had not happened before. This is something that was as new to the church as it could possibly be. Miracles were not new. Signs and wonders were not new. Teaching people about Jesus was not new. But touching somebody that they might receive their miracle, that they might receive the Holy Ghost in particular, was brand new. They did it for sickness, but this time they did it to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And so, this is what God is doing in Christian Life Center. God has entrusted us with the type of atmosphere where miracles can happen. You are in an atmosphere right now, my God have mercy, where miracles can happen. And you know, miracles are, are interesting because miracles, miracles do not require emotion at all. An American sensational religious culture has, my God, you know we've been having church around here. There's three bobby pins clustered right here. The American sort of spirit-led sensationalism is extremely emotional when it comes to miracles. And, and I promise you, when you get a miracle, you will be extremely emotional. Woo! When, that, when you were sick and all of a sudden you're well, anybody, anybody can testify that's happened to you? There, there was pain in your body and all of a sudden instantaneously it's gone? That's happened to me twice. It was there one moment and it left and never came back. I've seen it happen for others thousands of times. But faith requires no emotion. Yoo faith and emotion are not the same thing. Emotion is a component. It can be added to it. But faith is action in obedience to God's direction. That's what faith is. And you can do that without any emotion at all. Let me tell you something about faith. I was preaching in Northwest Florida in a wonderful church, amazing congregation. And I was blessed to be there. And I was preaching about miracles and uh, I felt to have anyone who wanted a miracle to come forward. If you want a miracle, uh, step out of where you are and, and make a spectacle of yourself and walk towards this front and show Jesus with your body language. Let your walk be God's cue that says, I want you. And, and I said, if you come up here in faith, God's going to heal you. And I... I begin to watch people come up. Some people started crying. The faith came on them, and they realized what's about to happen. Other people came up, and they were just walking. And, and one person all the way on that side over there came up. He started walking up, and this dude was, he was built like a brick house. 
He had muscles in places I didn't know you could have muscles. And when he walked up, he did not have a happy look on his face, and he was glaring at me. And the way he was walking was like... <laughs> and I was like, I'm watching him, but I'm trying not to watch him, but I could not stop watching. Like, he's, he's coming towards me. I mean, that doesn't look healthy. And so as he made his way to that side of the altar, I strategically made my way to this side of the altar and let somebody else pray for him. And everybody lifted their hands and we began to pray for miracles and, and, and miracles began to happen. People started testifying immediately. They were being healed in their bodies. That happened so many times in Scripture and that's available today. And, and I finally got over to this gentleman over here and he was... He had his hands lifted, and pastor was motioning me over, and so I just touched him, and, and he, he looked up at me. He said, I have a hernia right here from lifted weights. I was like, Jesus, heal this man's hernia right now in Jesus' name. And I just walked away in case it didn't happen, and he got disappointed. And he can do whatever he's going to do. And, and I, I literally was over here, and the pastor, I turned around, the pastor was waving me over, and this guy was sobbing. I went back over to this man. And this man, is, his countenance had changed, and he said, it's gone. He said, the hernia is totally gone. And he kept checking. It's kind, of, it's kind of astounding when that happens. It's gone. And, and he looked at me and he's like, Preacher, I want to tell you something right now. He said, I did not believe this. He said, you ticked me off. I was so mad. He said, I did not come up here to get a miracle. I came up here to prove it doesn't work. I come up here to prove to myself this is a bunch of fake nonsense. And I said, it reminded me of a man in 2 Kings chapter 5 by the name of Naaman. The Syrian who the prophet said, go dip in Jordan seven times. And the Bible says he was ticked off. He was wroth. He was angry. He's like, I thought the prophet would come out and strike his hand over the place and say unto the lepers that he thought this, he thought A, he thought B, he thought C. And the prophet never got out of his rocking chair. And the prophet said, go get in the dirty Jordan and dip seven times. Go humiliate yourself. Go lose your image. Go let go of your pride. Go let go of your idea of how God's supposed to work in your life and do what I say. Or go home a leper. That's what Elisha said. And he got in the water and he was ticked. But when he did what the man of God said seven times in the water, it didn't matter how he felt. He obeyed what the word of God was. And it didn't matter that Mr. Hernia came up here and he was trying to prove. The point is, is when the preacher said, get out and come up, he actually made the move. Faith is not based upon how you feel. Faith is based upon what you do. Faith is based upon obedience in action you don't have to feel anything just take the step and watch God do a miracle I want to tell you something that's not a Joe Campatella thing that's a faith thing we, we need to stop putting ourselves in some sub-Christian level that says maybe one day I'll be powerful enough to lay hands on somebody and God will do something. That is a lie from the pit of hell. Amen. Amen. You know what the qualification is to lay hands on somebody? Now, I'm going to qualify all this in just a moment. I'm going to give you the balance to all this. But I want to just release you first and then I'll put the guidelines on. You know, what the you know what the prerequisites are? You don't have to have a doctorate degree in theology and handology. 
demonology, mysticism. You don't have to have any of that. You know what the prerequisite is? Believers. How many believers we got in this room? Wave a hand at me. You can get your hand on somebody and say, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, be made whole, be delivered, be healed, be set free, be blessed, be renewed, receive your miracle. All you got to do is be a believer. Somebody shout, I'm a believer. Start acting like it. Start using what's inside of you. Start putting that machine to work that's alive inside of your body looking for a need. We've got to get field focused. We've got to put our eyes on the field. There are miracles waiting to happen. There are souls waiting to be prayed through. Anybody want God to use you? Come on, wave a hand. I need some audience participation tonight. I want God to use me. I don't want to just sit on a pew. I don't want to just sit. Man, the only way you can be comfortable sitting on a pew is if you don't read the same Bible I read. Of course, we're, everybody's sitting on pews right now. I'm not, I'm not saying that. We got to sit on pews sometime. This is all the, if this, if this is the fullness of your Christian experience, man, there's a door you need to walk through. And the laying on of hands is a very old doctrine. It's something that comes from the Old Testament. It's something that somehow God implemented. You know, I learned this. A while ago, and it just absolutely floored me. You know, your body literally produces its own electrical power. Y'all knew that? Bunch of geeks. Oh, when I, I, there's literally, your body produces electricity. That's astounding to me. Now, we all know your body can conduct electricity. Anybody got this? The, the slick shoes, you ever put them on, like rub them on carpet when you were a kid or maybe even as an adult? You walk up to somebody and you're rubbing your shoes on the carpet. Praise the Lord. Zap! You got to get those cheap shoes for that, though. You got to go get those, like, real, they have to have vinyl on the bottom. Can't get leather. Leather doesn't work. Got to get vinyl. Man, when my mom would buy me new shoes, I knew I was going to shock so many people. As a kid, just rub them. What happens? Static electricity builds up in your body, and when you touch somebody, you release everything that has been stored in your body to that person. Everything that's been building up, when you touch somebody, it leaves you and goes to them. Why did God do something like that? Well, to show us a principle. If you build up some Jesus energy in your personal prayer life, in your personal devotions, in your personal study time, if you build up some Jesus power and build up some, a reservoir of that anointing, when it's time for you to put your hand on somebody, something is going to be released through you that can change that person's life. Do you know if you get enough Jesus inside of you, you can touch somebody and literally change their life forever? There were two people that put their hands on me when I was 13 years old. I'll never forget those two people. Gina Jeter and Leonard Burroughs were the two people. Gina Jeter was my, ended up being my teacher at our Christian school, Souls Harbor Christian Academy. And Leonard Burroughs was just, let me tell you how who he was. He was a stucco man. 
stucco. Y'all know about stucco? Put the, you put the, what's it called, Brother Nate? Is it the lathe? Lath? It's spelled the same way, isn't it? <laughs> put the lath on the wall, you tack it in, and then you get the, 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 the cement, you put it on there, and you texture. That was his occupation. He was a stucco man. Every once in a while, Leonard Burroughs would sing a hymn in our church. He was not a preacher. He was not an apostle. His name is not known throughout the world. He was a faithful saint of God. And when he touched me, the Holy Ghost of God came into my body by his laying on of hands and I began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. And my life was changed forever. A stucco guy. And the devil may tell you, who do you think you are? You're not even a preacher. Who cares? I'm a believer. I am a believer. Oh, Jesus. And they didn't give up on me. They prayed for me, and I got the Holy Ghost. And, and since that time, I have, I have found favor in Jesus Christ, and I have been blessed by Jesus Christ to where he has put me in situation to put my hands on someone and pray for them and watch miracles happen. This goes back to the Old Testament when Isaac laid his hands on Jacob and blessed him. There's something about the laying on of hands. Moses laid his hands, put his hands on Joshua and prophesied over him. Elisha laid his hands on King Joash and prophesied over him. Jesus touched thousands. Peter and John laid their hands on all the city of Samaria. Ananias laid his hands on Paul. Who was Ananias? Just some random guy in Acts chapter 9. That thank God he did not use the excuse, I'm not a preacher. God said, go lay hands on Paul. And Ananias said, I'll do it. And Paul received his sight, received the Holy Ghost, and got baptized in Jesus' name. Paul laid his hands on many he laid his hands on the disciples at Ephesus, and they were all filled. This is Acts 19, 1 through 5. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost, with the evidence of speaking in tongues. When Paul was shipwrecked on Malta, the island of Malta, he laid hands on someone with life-threatening dysentery. Highly contagious. They would quarantine people. They learned to quarantine people with dysentery because you would catch it and die. Paul laid his hands upon them, and they were healed. And the rest, this is so incredible to me, the rest of the barbarians on the island heard, and that started the prayer line for everybody that was sick. I do want to warn you, once you get a reputation of praying for people and God answering your prayer, Hygiene's going to kind of go out the window. Listen, we've been in foreign countries. We used to do something. Uh, we've done it here and there, but it was done a lot more before. And we, maybe we need to get into it again. I don't know, but we used to do something called prayer lines. Anybody know what a prayer line is? Man, it's like a... I've only seen like video clips of it, but those Indians, like when they would capture a prisoner... They would, give them, they would give them a choice of death or run through the gauntlet. And the Indians would line up in a row on either side. There would be this row on one side and a row on the other side, and they would get their hatchets and their tomahawks and their clubs and any sharp knives, and they would line up one person apart, and that person could either choose to die instantly or run through the gauntlet. If you live through the gauntlet... 
You get to be a part of the tribe. You're a warrior in the tribe. And they would, when that person would start running, they would stab them, hit them, bonk them, do whatever they could. That's sort of what a prayer line is. If you got a bad attitude when you start that prayer line, I promise you, you will not have the willpower to keep that bad attitude once you get out of that prayer line. If you're bound by something at the beginning of the prayer line, once 29 people lay hands on you, you are not going to be bound anymore. And we've been to other countries where people just line up and one after another, once they realize, hey, there's healing in the house, there's healing at the altar, there's healing flowing right now. Do you think they're going to be standing off from you? They're going to put their head down. I've had people run and put their head down and say, pray for me. I've been sick. I've been running fever. Pray for me. Hallelujah. And listen, everybody's going to die. Might as well die laying hands on somebody, okay? You're going to get some disease and die. It's inevitable. You don't, don't lie to yourself. Something's going to kill you. If you're going to go out, you might as well go out praying for people to be healed. How did he die? He prayed for 2,000 people and one of them got him. Hey, that's a good way to go. Anyway, that's my personal philosophy on that. (laughs) Paul laid hands on Timothy. Watch this, 2 Timothy 1 and 6. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. When I touched you, what was in me went into you. You can only... Give to people what's inside of you. The elders that Paul ordained also laid hands on Timothy. First Timothy 4, 14. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which is given thee by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. And then the book of Hebrews teaches us that the laying on of hands was a foundational apostolic doctrine. Hebrews 6 verses 1 and 2. I was a youth pastor for several years and we did everything we could to keep young people's attention and we had a youth party one night and we had played the games, we'd done the devotion and everybody's just kind of having a good time and turns out the gentleman that owned the house had a crazy dog that I think probably had some type of chemical imbalance or something. It was a nuts dog, and he bought this gigantic shock collar. And so somebody got the idea. They found it, and they're like, hey, guys, you know, it's, it's youth night. We're bored. Let's have some fun with the shock collar. And so there were several times. One was a bark collar. The other one was just like a shock collar. Like it didn't matter if you barked or not. You could press the button and it zapped you. And so several of the guys got the bark collar and they put it around their necks. And they were like, how loud do you have to talk? And so they're like, hey, 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 ah! It was a great night. I'll never forget that night. Then we wanted to see how powerful the shock collar was. And so we gathered together and we held onto the shock collar. It was like settings one to ten. And we all got in a circle. It was like 20, 30 young people got in a circle. And one person held one of the contacts on the shock collar. The other person held the other contact. And everybody else was holding hands. So they put it on level one and pushed the button. And nobody felt anything. And we're holding each other's fingers. And then they pushed level two. And you, all of a sudden, you could feel this, like, tiny trickle. Like this little, little tickle feeling in your finger. 
All these guys are smiling at me right now. Like this, we're going to have some shot collar orders on Amazon being placed tonight. I can feel it. And then they went to level three, and it's like, you feel it. It's like the tickle's getting strong. Then they went to level four, and, and it got a little uncomfortable. Then they went to level five, and this muscle in between the thumb and the index finger started contracting. And then they're like, you ready for level six? And all the guys were like, of course we are. Level six, ugh. Level seven, ah! And then the sick individual went straight to level 10. <laughs> and pushed the button, and the, and the circle exploded with screams. It was a, I can't imagine what kind of dog would require an almost electric chair strapped around his neck to regulate his behavior. But the thing that stood out to me was the flow of the current between the people touching each other. You know, there's a reason why God says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. <laughs> get together. I'm going to release a power and I want it to touch everybody. Listen, there's a bunch of people in this world that say, I don't go to church. I don't do organized religion. I just stay home. You don't read the Bible either. Because the Bible says we are a body joined together. Everybody's a different part of this body, but there's something that wants to flow through the body that's connected to itself. There's nutrients and vitamins and blood and white blood cells, and you don't get the benefit of the flow unless you're connected to the body. Well, which, which service, Pastor, which service? I want to tell you every service is important. God have mercy. Every service is vitally. Listen, you on Sunday mornings, you're going to get a totally different meal than you get on Wednesday nights. It's a different flow. It's a different meal. It's a different focus. Every once in a while, we have a Sunday morning like a Wednesday night. And maybe every once in a while, we have a Wednesday night like a Sunday morning. But for the most part, this is like we get into nitty-gritty stuff on Wednesday night. And if all you do is Sunday morning. You're eating jelly donut, Jesus. Not kale. Which is harder? Which, which service is harder to go to, Wednesday night or Sunday morning? Well, Wednesday night, you're kind of getting off work. You're a little bit tired. And you, man, maybe I'll do online tonight and... and I'll be there Sunday morning and, and well, hey, God bless you. you. You missed the current. You saw what happened, but you missed the current. And what about Sunday night? Why is, why is there something so different? You know, sometimes Sunday night's real quick and powerful, and we just shout and go home. And this Sunday night, Brother A.J. Holloway was here, and he spoke fluent Greek for nine hours, and it was just so refreshing. And the altar call was like, I mean, you've got to listen to every single thing he says and listen to it nine times. God's fluent in Hebrew. And, 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 but the altar call was so rich, but it wasn't that long. But we had the altar call before before. The preaching, it was all messed up Sunday night. Everything was off. Everybody was shouting and praising God and laying hands on each other before the preaching. And then after the preaching, we had a quick prayer, and it was just so fulfilling. And you never know what you're going to get. And now here we are. What's going on? Jesus says, come on. Come on back. Come on back. The listen, and the, the, sometimes the more inconvenient it is for you to be here, the better meal you're going to get. The more health you're going to receive. The more wholeness you're going to receive. The better healing you're going to receive. Sometimes the harder it is to get to Jesus, the greater the reward you're going to get when you get there the greater the miracle you're going to get when you get there everybody say got to stay connected come on somebody say every service is so important you got to be connected to the current you got to be plugged into the body 
you got to have your hand on somebody else. you got to join with somebody else that's full of that current. you got to be in proximity. Otherwise, you won't get that spark. Hallelujah. 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 I'm thankful for God principles. I'm so thankful. Everything about the kingdom is, is wrong in the world's eyes. Everything's off. If you want to get more, you got to give up more. If you want to go up, you got to go down. If you want to live, you got to die. If you want to be powerful, you got to become weak. If you want the miraculous, you got to do the inconvenient. That's a big principle right there. I'm going to say it again. If you want the miraculous, you have to embrace the inconvenient. If you want the miraculous, you must embrace the inconvenient. If you want the, what am I talking about? I'm talking about Zacchaeus had to climb a tree to get the attention of Jesus. Blind Bartimaeus had to scream and make everybody else mad to get his eyes well. The woman with the issue of blood had to press through the crowd and elbow some people to get her healing over and over and over. If you want the miraculous, you have to embrace the inconvenient. Hey, let's get real. Prayer. This is going to sound very carnal. Y'all forgive your pastor. Prayer is always inconvenient. 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 I've never had one prayer meeting in my life. Y'all just shut down on me. That wasn't inconvenient. Not one. Wouldn't it be nice if Jesus made prayer convenient? My goodness, what a perfect four-hour spot. I've never read the Bible one time where it was convenient. I've never danced unto the Lord with all my might one single time based upon how convenient it was. CLC, we want to walk in the miraculous. We must embrace the inconvenient. And see, these things are principles that will catch up to you. If you neglect what's inconvenient and neglect what's inconvenient and neglect, you will eventually lose the miraculous in your life. Yes, yes. It will withdraw from you. But if you embrace, what did Jesus say? Hey, I want you, if you're going to follow me, I want you to do this really convenient thing every day. Every day, make up your mind. It's going to be very convenient. Take up your cross. The splintery, heavy, death representation cross. And do it every day. Don't miss a day. Die daily. Every day. You'll have life everlasting. Lift your hands and say, Jesus, I want the miraculous. <laughs> I want the miraculous. I want the miraculous. I want your touch. I want your presence. I want your anointing. Help me to get over myself. Help me to embrace what's highly inconvenient. Sometimes the most highly inconvenient is a sign of miracles about to happen. Naaman, Naaman, it's so inconvenient for you to get in that river, but the greatest miracle you're ever going to experience in your life is about to happen for you. 
Ah, help us, Jesus. We want it. We want it. We'll pay the price for it. Hey, Jesus, you're looking at a church here tonight that will pay the price for the miraculous. You're looking at a bunch of people in this room right now. They're willing to pay the price for the miraculous. It does not come free. We've got to pay the price, and we are willing to do it. Hey, see us right now, Lord. Hey, we may not be the smartest. We may not be the most talented. We may not be the prettiest. We may not be the richest. But, Lord, we're going to be the hungriest. We're going to be the boldest. We're going to be the most aggressive. We're going to go after you with all our might. (laughs) Hallelujah. So I'm going to, I'm not even, I've got six pages that I will remove temptation from my eyes. I think God just did what he wanted tonight, and I want to tell you the fulfillment of the matter. God wants to release you. Did you say that? God wants to use me. Say, God wants to do miracles through me. Come on, can you, can you say that whether you feel it or not? I'm not going to look at you this time. I want you to just close your eyes. Don't look around. If you want it, if there's any desire in you at all, I want you to say it in faith. God wants to do miracles through me. Say it. God wants to use me. Yes. God wants to release this church in the miraculous. I feel like we're waiting. We're, there is something in the atmosphere that's always waiting on somebody else to instigate it. Always waiting on somebody. No, no, you are a believer. You've got the Holy Ghost. You've got the creative power of Jesus Christ inside of your mouth, inside of your body. It's time to let him go. It's time to release him. feel like we are entering we are entering a season where God is going to release the saints at Christian Life Center on a level we have never walked in before I'm going to say it again because these are not my closing remarks God is ready to release the saints of Christian Life Center to walk in a dimension of operating in the Holy Ghost that we have never done before you're, you are going to be used in the gifts of the Spirit in these altars. You are going to be used in the gift of faith, the word of knowledge, the working of miracles. You are literally going to lay hands on diseased people that walk into this building and God is going to heal them when you say in Jesus name you are going to pray for people and walk them through the process of receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost just like Peter and John did in Samaria when you touch them God you got to see it with me you got to imagine this come on let your faith go right now I want you to imagine yourself putting your hands on somebody that needs the Holy Ghost and all of a sudden the power of God just erupts out of their mouth. Come on, some of you are going to lay hands on people in wheelchairs. You're going to be so bold with Jesus Christ. You're going to say, get up out of that wheelchair in Jesus' name. And they're going to jump up. They're going to actually jump up by the power of God. God is ready to release the saints of God in the power that he has promised us. God is ready. He's calling. I feel the voice of the Lord who wants wants to do it. I'm going to give out some gifts. I'm going to give out some boldness. I'm going to give out some faith you've never had before. I'm going to give out some spiritual confidence you've never walked in before. I hear the voice of God calling. Come on, let me use you. Let me use your hands. Let me use your voice. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. 
I do want to tell you, and I'll, and I'll get into this, I think, Sunday night, if the Lord's willing, and if I, feel, if I think I have the direction that I have for Sunday night. You must make sure, in a spirit-led church, that everything you do turns attention to God. If what you are doing to minister or to worship or to flow causes people to look at you instead of him, it's not of the Holy Ghost. If what you are doing is so startling that people stop flowing and they look at you, you have removed their attention from the flow. And we've got to pray. We have got to say, Jesus, help me to do all things in the Spirit and decently and in order. And man, when you have that recipe right, my God have mercy, power, power flows in the kingdom of God. It's 822. A miracle has occurred. It's 823. It just changed while I was talking. Seven minutes before 830. Why don't we stand? I want you to lift your hands and say, God, use us. Use my friends. Use my neighbors. If you, if you have the confidence and, or just the faith or the aggression, why don't you grab somebody by the hand? Ladies with ladies, spouses families i want you to pray don't pray even pray for yourself pray for your father pray for your mother pray for your son your daughter your spouse your friend i want you to say god use their hands god use their voice i rebuke every disqualifying voice from their mind i rebuke every lie from hell that would stop them from flowing in the power that you have made available for your people God, let miracles happen when they touch people. Let miracles happen when they say in Jesus' name, put the boldness that was on Philip and their spirit. Put the boldness that was on Peter and John. Oh, Jesus, you said, the works that I do, greater than these shall you do. Lord, give us that boldness and faith and unction. In the name of Jesus Christ. God, raise up our young people. Raise up fanatical young people that don't care about what they look like. Raise up fanatical young men and fanatical young girls. They could care less what they look like. They could care less what they sound like. They've got to see the miracle. They've got to see it happen. Oh, we want that kind of church. We want that kind of relationship. We want that kind of revival. Praise God, praise God. What an amazing atmosphere of faith and hunger in this place. Thank you for coming tonight. God bless you in Jesus' name. We love you. Jesus loves you. You go and pray about this, and God's going to begin to use you in ways you've never been used. Be dismissed, and we will see you this weekend. Prayer and services. God bless you in Jesus' name. Greet somebody before you go. Shake their hands. Don't let them escape. Go make a lunch appointment. Make a dinner date.